Hello and welcome. Today, I'm going to whisper to you about a figure who has captivated imaginations for centuries, a figure whose name has become synonymous with fear and legend. I'm talking about Vlad III, more commonly known as Vlad the Impaler, or Dracula. So, get comfortable, relax, and let's delve into the fascinating and dark story of this historical figure together. Vlad III was born in 1431 in the Transylvanian city of Sigasora, which was part of the Kingdom of Hungary at the time. His birth took place into a world filled with political intrigue, power struggles, and wars, shaping the man he would become. Vlad was the second son of Vlad II Dracul, a member of the Order of the Dragon, a chivalric order dedicated to defending Christianity against the Ottoman Empire. The name Dracula itself means the dragon, and young Vlad would later be known as Dracula, meaning son of the dragon. Growing up, Vlad was surrounded by the harsh realities of medieval power dynamics. His father was a voivode, or ruler, of Wallachia, a region of significant strategic importance between Christian Europe and the expanding Ottoman Empire. This position placed Vlad II in a precarious situation, constantly balancing alliances and enmities with both powerful neighbors and local nobility. It was in this turbulent environment that Vlad III learned the ruthless lessons of power and survival, lessons that would deeply influence his later actions. Vlad III was born into a world of nobility and conflict, deeply rooted in the complexities of medieval European politics. His father, Vlad II Dracul, was not only a ruler but also a member of the Order of the Dragon, an elite society formed by the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund to defend Christianity, particularly against the Ottoman Turks. This prestigious order played a significant role in shaping the ambitions and responsibilities of Vlad's family. The Dracul name, meaning dragon, was a mark of this honor, and it carried with it expectations of loyalty, bravery, and an unwavering commitment to protect the Christian world. Vlad's mother, though not much is known about her in historical records, was likely a woman of noble birth, possibly from the Moldavian or Transylvanian nobility. This union of his parents created a powerful and influential family, but one constantly surrounded by danger. Vlad had two brothers, Mircha, the eldest, who was his father's designated heir, and Radu, the youngest, who would later become known as Radu the Handsome. The brothers' lives were deeply intertwined with the volatile political landscape of the region, a factor that would lead to both cooperation and rivalry among them. During Vlad's childhood, the people of Wallachia and Transylvania lived in small, rural communities. The majority of the population were peasants who worked the land under a feudal system. Life was harsh and unforgiving, with most people living in simple wooden houses, farming to sustain themselves, and relying on seasonal cycles to guide their activities. The nobility, on the other hand, lived in stone fortresses or large manor houses, surrounded by their retainers and servants. They enjoyed privileges and wealth, but also bore the heavy burden of defending their lands from constant threats, whether from rival noble families, external invaders like the Ottomans, or internal rebellions. Religion played a central role in the lives of the people during this time. The Christian Church was not only a spiritual guide, but also a powerful political force. Church leaders often wielded as much power as kings or princes, and religious festivals and rituals were integral to the daily life of the populace. However, the threat of the Ottoman Empire, which followed Islam, created an atmosphere of religious tension and fear, further complicating the lives of those living in the border regions like Wallachia. The period was marked by frequent wars, both between Christian kingdoms and against the expanding Ottoman Empire. 
These conflicts brought not only physical destruction, but also a constant state of insecurity. Nobles like Vlad's father were often forced to choose sides in these battles, sometimes even switching allegiances to preserve their power and protect their lands. This environment of mistrust, betrayal, and shifting loyalties was the backdrop to Vlad's early years, deeply influencing his view of the world and his approach to leadership. As Vlad grew up, he was exposed to both the luxuries of his noble birth and the brutal realities of the time. He would have been trained in the arts of war, learning to ride, fight with various weapons, and understand military tactics. At the same time, he was likely educated in diplomacy, language, and the traditions of his people. This dual education prepared him for the life of a ruler, one who would need to defend his land with both the sword and the mind. However, the constant threat of invasion and the need to maintain power at all costs meant that Vlad's upbringing was also marked by a harsh understanding of justice and retribution. In a time when loyalty was often bought and sold, and power was maintained through fear as much as respect, Vlad learned the value of ruthless decisiveness, a trait that would define his reign and his legacy. In this world, where survival depended on strength, cunning, and sometimes cruelty, Vlad III was shaped into the ruler he would become, a man feared by his enemies, and both revered and reviled by his own people. During the time of Vlad III's birth and early life, the political landscape of Eastern Europe was complex and tumultuous, defined by a constant struggle for power among various factions, both within and outside the region. The region where Vlad was born, Wallachia, was a small principality situated between the Kingdom of Hungary to the west and the Ottoman Empire to the south. This strategic location made Wallachia a buffer state, often caught in the middle of the power struggles between these two major powers. Wallachia's position in governance. Wallachia, along with the neighboring principalities of Moldavia and Transylvania, was part of the larger political mosaic of Eastern Europe. These principalities were ruled by voivodes, or princes, who were often selected by local nobility, known as boyars. The voivodes were expected to maintain the delicate balance of power between their local nobility and the more powerful foreign rulers, a task that required both diplomatic skill and military prowess. The voivode of Wallachia, like Vlad III's father Vlad II Dracul, had to navigate the treacherous political waters of the time, where allegiances could shift quickly. The Voivode held almost absolute power within his domain but was always under pressure from the Boyars, who could easily turn against him if they felt their interests were threatened. This internal tension within Wallachia was a constant challenge for any ruler, leading to frequent uprisings and conflicts among the nobility. The Influence of the Kingdom of Hungary To the west of Wallachia, the Kingdom of Hungary was a dominant force in the region. Hungary was a powerful and wealthy kingdom with significant military resources, and its kings often sought to exert influence over Wallachia and other neighboring states. Wallachian rulers, including Vlad II Dracul, were frequently drawn into alliances with Hungary, often as a means of securing protection against the growing threat of the Ottoman Empire. Hungary's influence in Wallachia was not just military, but also cultural and religious. As a Catholic kingdom, Hungary sought to spread Catholicism into the Orthodox Christian regions of Wallachia and beyond, adding a religious dimension to the political conflicts of the time. However, this religious influence was met with resistance from the Orthodox population, creating further tension within the region. The Expanding Ottoman Empire The Ottoman Empire, one of the most powerful empires of the time, was rapidly expanding its territory during Vlad III's era. The Ottomans were pushing northward into Europe, and Wallachia, 
along with the neighboring principalities, stood directly in their path. The Ottoman threat was a constant source of fear and anxiety for the people of Wallachia, and for its rulers, it was a challenge that could not be ignored. The Ottomans often sought to bring Wallachia and other neighboring states under their influence through a combination of military force and diplomacy. Many Wallachian rulers, including Vlad II Dracul, were forced to pay tribute to the Ottoman Sultan as a way to maintain their thrones and protect their lands from invasion. This tribute was a symbol of submission, but it was also a pragmatic choice for rulers who wished to avoid outright conquest. However, paying tribute did not guarantee peace. The Ottomans were known for their aggressive expansionist policies and they frequently intervened in the internal affairs of Wallachia, supporting rival claimants to the throne who were more favorable to their interests. This created a volatile situation where Wallachian rulers had to constantly navigate their relationships with the Ottoman Empire, often playing a dangerous game of loyalty and rebellion. The role of the boyars and internal power struggles. Within Wallachia itself, the boyars, or local nobles, held significant power and influence. These landowning elites were not just powerful economically but also played a crucial role in the selection and support of the voivode. The relationship between the voivode and the boyars was often tense, as the boyars could be quick to turn against a ruler who did not act in their interests. The boyars were often divided in their loyalties, with some favoring closer ties with Hungary, while others leaned towards the Ottoman Empire. This division among the boyars led to frequent power struggles and even assassinations, as different factions vied for control of the throne. A voivode like Vlad II Dracul had to be constantly vigilant, as betrayal could come from within his own court as easily as from outside forces. The Broader European Context Beyond Wallachia, Europe was in a state of flux during this period. The Holy Roman Empire, various Italian city-states, and other European powers were all engaged in their own internal and external conflicts. The rise of the Ottoman Empire was a common concern, leading to occasional alliances among Christian states to counter the Ottoman threat. However, these alliances were often fragile and marked by competing interests. The broader European context also included the fall of Constantinople in 1453, a pivotal event that marked the end of the Byzantine Empire and solidified the Ottoman Empire's dominance in the region. This event sent shockwaves throughout Europe, further heightening the sense of urgency among Christian states to resist Ottoman expansion. Vlad III, known later in history as Vlad the Impaler, spent his early years in an environment shaped by political instability and familial tension. Born in 1431 in the Transylvanian town of Sigasora, his first ten years were marked by experiences that would profoundly influence his character and future actions. Vlad's father, Vlad II Dracul, was a significant figure in the region a member of the Order of the Dragon, and the Voivode, ruler, of Wallachia. This position placed him at the center of the complex and often dangerous political landscape of Eastern Europe. As a young boy, Vlad would have been acutely aware of his father's responsibilities and the constant threats to their family's power. From the moment of his birth, Vlad was groomed for leadership. Even as a child, he was surrounded by the realities of warfare, politics, and the necessity of strategic alliances. His father's position required the constant balancing act of maintaining Wallachia's independence while navigating the demands of powerful neighbors, particularly the Kingdom of Hungary and the expanding Ottoman Empire. Vlad's early years were spent in the family's fortified residence in Sigasora, where he lived with his parents and his two brothers, Mircha and Radu. His childhood, 
while certainly more privileged than that of the common people, was not free from the harsh realities of the time. The political tension in the region meant that Vlad and his brothers were constantly exposed to stories of war, betrayal, and the brutal means often used to maintain power. At a young age, Vlad would have started his education, which was likely rigorous and focused on both physical and intellectual development. He would have learned to read and write in the languages of the region, including Latin and possibly Greek or Hungarian. Education for noble children of his status also included instruction in the arts of war, horsemanship, and the use of weapons, skills that were essential for any ruler in a region as volatile as Wallachia. However, the political circumstances of the time soon brought significant upheaval to Vlad's life. In 1442, when Vlad was around 11 years old, his father Vlad II Dracul faced mounting pressure from the Ottoman Empire. Seeking to secure his throne and maintain a fragile peace, Vlad II entered into a complex arrangement with the Ottomans, which included offering his sons, Vlad and Radu, as hostages to the Ottoman Sultan Murad II. This act was meant to ensure Vlad II's loyalty and to prevent him from allying too closely with Hungary against the Ottomans. This event marked a dramatic shift in young Vlad's life. He and his younger brother Radu were taken from their homeland and transported to the Ottoman court. For Vlad, this experience was both formative and deeply traumatic. While he was treated well by his captors in terms of education and training, the reality of being a political hostage, knowing that his life was in constant danger depending on his father's actions, instilled in him a profound sense of distrust and a hardened view of the world. During his time in Ottoman custody, Vlad was exposed to the culture, military strategies, and political tactics of the Ottomans. He was educated in the ways of his captors, learning about their military techniques, governance, and even their language. This education was intended to shape him into a future ruler who would be favorable to Ottoman interests. However, this period of captivity also fostered a deep resentment and hatred for the Ottomans and Vlad, which would later manifest in his brutal campaigns against them. While in captivity, Vlad also observed how power was wielded through fear and intimidation, lessons that would profoundly influence his later rule. The psychological impact of being a hostage, combined with the knowledge that his fate was tied to his father's political maneuvers, created a young man who was both determined to regain control of his destiny and willing to use extreme measures to do so. By the time Vlad reached the age of 10, his formative years had already been marked by experiences that set him apart from his peers. He was a young boy thrust into a world of political intrigue, exposed to the brutal realities of power, and educated in the ways of both European and Ottoman rulers. These early years laid the foundation for the man he would become, a ruler known for his ruthlessness and his unyielding pursuit of power in a region defined by constant conflict. Consolidating Power in Wallachia When Vlad III reclaimed the throne of Wallachia in 1456, he inherited a principality that was fractured and weakened by years of internal strife and external pressures. The Boyars, the powerful noble class of Wallachia, were divided with many having supported his rival, Vladislav II, who Vlad had defeated to take the throne. Vlad knew that to maintain his rule, he had to crush any opposition and ensure that the boyars were either loyal or too afraid to challenge him. One of Vlad's first actions upon securing the throne was to root out those he believed were responsible for the deaths of his father and brother, as well as those who had opposed him in his previous attempts to claim power. Vlad summoned a large gathering of boyars to his court, ostensibly for a feast or council. However, this gathering turned into a trap. Vlad had many of these nobles arrested, 
and in a show of ruthless authority, he ordered their execution. Some were impaled, a brutal method of execution that would become synonymous with his rule, while others were forced into hard labor, building his new fortress at Poenary, high in the Carpathian Mountains. This purge of the boyars was not just an act of vengeance, it was a calculated move to eliminate those who might pose a threat to his authority and to send a clear message that he would not tolerate dissent. By breaking the power of the old nobility, Vlad was able to centralize his authority and reduce the influence of the boyars, making it clear that Wallachia was under his control. The Impalement and the Cult of Fear the method of execution that Vlad III became infamous for was impalement. This gruesome practice involved driving a wooden stake through the body of the condemned, often from the rectum or abdomen through the mouth, and then erecting the stake so that the victim would die slowly, sometimes over several days. This horrifying method of punishment was designed to instill fear in both his enemies and his subjects. Vlad used impalement not only as a tool of justice, but also as a psychological weapon. He ordered mass impalements of criminals, rival nobles, and those accused of treason. The sight of thousands of impaled bodies lining the roads leading to his capital, Targovist, served as a stark warning to anyone who dared to challenge his rule. This macabre display of power earned him the moniker Teeps, meaning the impaler. The use of impalement and other brutal methods of punishment was part of Vlad's broader strategy to maintain order and instill discipline in his domain. Wallachia, like much of Eastern Europe at the time, was plagued by lawlessness and banditry. Vlad's draconian measures were intended to create a sense of stability and security, albeit through fear. His harsh justice extended to both the common people and the nobility, ensuring that all understood the consequences of disobedience. Relations with the Ottoman Empire During these years, Vlad III also had to navigate the complex and dangerous relationship with the Ottoman Empire. Wallachia, strategically located between Christian Europe and the Ottoman-controlled Balkans, was a vital buffer state. The Ottoman Empire, under Sultan Mim II, expected Wallachia to pay tribute and provide military support. However, Vlad was not content to be a vassal of the Ottomans. Initially, Vlad paid the tribute demanded by the Ottomans, but his relationship with the empire was fraught with tension. Vlad resented the Ottoman overlordship and was determined to resist their influence. By 1459, Vlad had begun to withhold the tribute, a direct act of defiance against Sultan Mim II. This refusal was a significant provocation, as the Ottomans relied on these tributes from their vassal states to fund their military campaigns. In response to Vlad's defiance, the Ottomans sent envoys to demand payment and reaffirm Wallachia's submission. According to legend, when these envoys refused to remove their turbans in Vlad's presence, citing religious custom, Vlad had their turbans nailed to their heads as punishment for their perceived insolence. This act, whether wholly true or embellished, exemplifies the ruthlessness with which Vlad dealt with those who crossed him. Vlad's refusal to pay tribute and his increasingly hostile stance towards the Ottoman Empire set the stage for open conflict. He began to prepare Wallachia for war, strengthening his defenses and rallying his forces. Vlad knew that defying the Ottoman Empire was a dangerous gamble, but he was determined to assert Wallachia's independence. Campaigns against the Ottomans By 1461, tensions between Wallachia and the Ottoman Empire had reached a breaking point. Vlad launched a series of raids across the Danube River into Ottoman territory, targeting towns and villages. These raids were devastatingly effective, as Vlad used scorched earth tactics, burning crops, poisoning wells, 
and massacring entire settlements. The raids were not just military actions but psychological warfare designed to terrorize the Ottoman population and weaken their resolve. One of the most infamous episodes of Vlad's campaign against the Ottomans was the night attack at Targovist in 1462. Sultan Mem II, angered by Vlad's refusal to pay tribute and his aggressive raids, launched a massive invasion of Wallachia, leading an army of over 100,000 men. In response, Vlad employed guerrilla tactics, using the cover of night to launch surprise attacks on the Ottoman forces. The most dramatic of these was the night raid on the Ottoman camp outside Targovist. Vlad and a small force of his most trusted soldiers infiltrated the Ottoman camp under the cover of darkness, aiming to assassinate Sultan Mim II. Although the assassination attempt failed, the raid caused significant chaos and panic among the Ottoman troops. Vlad's forces killed thousands of Ottomans in the confusion, and the psychological impact of the raid was profound. As the Ottoman army advanced toward Targovist, they were met with one of Vlad's most notorious displays of brutality. The road leading to the city was lined with the impaled bodies of tens of thousands of Ottoman prisoners and those Vlad deemed traitors. This gruesome sight shocked and horrified the Ottoman soldiers, and Sultan Mem II reportedly turned back after witnessing the carnage, unwilling to continue the campaign against such a ruthless opponent. Struggles with Hungary and the decline of power Despite his successes against the Ottomans, Vlad's rule was not secure. His actions, particularly his refusal to pay tribute and his brutal methods, had alienated many potential allies, including the Kingdom of Hungary. John Anyadi's son, Matthias Corvinus, who had become King of Hungary, was under pressure to deal with Vlad's increasingly erratic behavior. Although Hungary and Wallachia had common cause in resisting Ottoman expansion, Vlad's independent actions made him a liability. In 1462, after his successful campaign against the Ottomans, Vlad sought assistance from Matthias Corvinus to continue his resistance. However, instead of receiving the support he expected, Vlad was betrayed. Matthias Corvinus, influenced by false documents allegedly showing that Vlad had negotiated with the Ottomans behind his back, had Vlad arrested and imprisoned. This betrayal marked the end of Vlad's reign and the beginning of a long period of captivity. Imprisonment in Hungary, 1462-1466 After his arrest by Matthias Corvinus, King of Hungary, in 1462, Vlad III found himself imprisoned, not as a common criminal, but rather as a political prisoner. His imprisonment was less about punishment for crimes and more about the complex web of alliances and enmities that defined the politics of the time. Vlad's aggressive stance against the Ottoman Empire had once aligned him with Hungary's interests, but his unpredictable behavior and the false accusations that he had sought an alliance with the Ottomans led Matthias to detain him. Vlad was held in various fortresses in Hungary, including Visegrad, a fortified town overlooking the Danube River. Though he was a prisoner, his conditions were not entirely harsh. He was allowed a degree of comfort, likely due to his noble status and the potential future political value he held. Despite being in captivity, Vlad was still seen by some as a potential asset in the ongoing conflict between Christian Europe and the Ottomans. Matthias Corvinus, aware of Vlad's military capabilities and his deep-rooted hatred for the Ottomans, kept Vlad under close watch, aware that he might need to call upon his services again. During his imprisonment, Vlad maintained correspondence with various European leaders, trying to secure his release and restore his position as the Voivode of Wallachia. 
He argued that his actions had always been in defense of Christendom against the Ottoman threat, and he sought to position himself as a key player in the ongoing crusades against the Ottomans. His letters reveal a man who was not defeated, but rather biding his time, waiting for the right moment to return to power. Vlad's imprisonment also allowed him time to reflect on his reign and the political machinations that had led to his downfall. He understood that his return to power would require not just military might, but also careful political alliances. It is likely that during this period, Vlad began to craft the strategies that would eventually lead to his restoration as Voivode. Political Maneuvering and Rehabilitation, 1466 to 1467. By 1466, the political landscape in Eastern Europe had shifted once again. The Ottoman Empire continued its expansion into Europe, and the threat it posed to the Christian kingdoms had grown even more pressing. Matthias Corvinus, facing increasing pressure from both the Ottomans and rival European powers, began to reconsider his position regarding Vlad. Vlad's reputation as a fierce and capable warrior had not been forgotten. Despite his brutal methods, many in Hungary and beyond still saw him as a potential leader who could effectively resist Ottoman encroachment. Matthias Corvinus, recognizing this, began to rehabilitate Vlad's image. The king started to circulate documents and testimonies that portray Vlad as a defender of the Christian faith, downplaying or justifying his previous actions as necessary in the fight against the Ottomans. This rehabilitation process involved careful diplomacy. Matthias needed to balance the interests of his own court, the Hungarian nobility, and his European allies, while also preparing Vlad for a potential return to power. To this end, Vlad was gradually granted more freedom and was allowed to participate in court activities, though he was still officially a prisoner. This period of semi-freedom allowed Vlad to rebuild his network of contacts and allies, positioning himself as a loyal servant of Hungary and the Christian cause. During this time, Vlad also began to consider a strategic marriage to bolster his claims and secure his position. Matthias Corvinus arranged for Vlad to marry a member of the Hungarian nobility, possibly Alona Shalagi, a relative of the king. This marriage was a political move designed to legitimize Vlad's claim to the Wallachian throne and to secure his loyalty to Hungary. Through this union, Vlad gained important connections within the Hungarian nobility, further strengthening his position. Preparation for Return to Power, 1467 By 1467, Vlad was fully rehabilitated in the eyes of the Hungarian court. The political climate had become increasingly favorable for his return to Wallachia. The region remained a key battleground in the ongoing struggle between the Ottoman Empire and Christian Europe, and Matthias Corvinus saw in Vlad a leader who could stabilize the region and resist Ottoman advances. However, Vlad's return to power was not guaranteed. Wallachia was still a volatile region, with multiple claimants to the throne and deep divisions among the boyars. Moreover, the Ottomans had installed a ruler in Wallachia who was loyal to them, and they would not relinquish control easily. Understanding these challenges, Vlad began to prepare carefully for his return. He secured promises of support from Hungarian nobles and sought to gather a military force capable of retaking Wallachia. Vlad also reached out to the Transylvanian Saxons, a powerful and wealthy group who had previously been his adversaries. He offered them favorable trade agreements and protection in exchange for their support, recognizing the strategic importance of their backing. At the same time, Vlad knew that he needed to win the support of the Wallachian boyars. Despite his previous brutal purges, 
Vlad sought to reconcile with some of the more powerful Boyer families, promising them positions of influence and security in exchange for their loyalty. He also communicated with the Orthodox Church in Wallachia, presenting himself as a defender of the faith and seeking their endorsement. Vlad's preparations for his return were methodical and strategic, reflecting the lessons he had learned from his previous reign and his time in captivity. He understood that brute force alone would not secure his position, he needed to build a broad base of support and ensure that his return would be seen as legitimate by both his subjects and his allies. As 1467 drew to a close, Vlad was poised to make his move. He had secured the backing of Matthias Corvinus and had built a coalition of Hungarian nobles, Transylvanian Saxons, and Wallachian boyars who were ready to support his return to the throne. All that remained was to launch his campaign and reclaim his position as Voivode of Wallachia. Return to Power, 1467 to 1468. In late 1467, Vlad III was ready to reclaim the throne of Wallachia. Having secured the support of Hungarian King Matthias Corvinus and the backing of several influential factions, Vlad launched his campaign to retake control of his homeland. His return to Wallachia was not merely a matter of military conquest, it was a calculated effort to reassert his authority and restore stability to a region that had been racked by internal strife and external threats. The initial phase of Vlad's return was marked by swift and decisive action. With the backing of Hungarian forces and support from the Transylvanian Saxons, Vlad crossed into Wallachia, confronting the forces of the Ottoman-backed ruler who had taken his place. The campaign was brutal, with Vlad employing his usual tactics of fear and terror to break the resistance of those who opposed him. He once again utilized impalement as a tool of psychological warfare, sending a clear message to both his enemies and his potential allies that his rule would be as uncompromising as ever. Vlad's return to power was successful, and by early 1468, he had re-established himself as the Voivode of Wallachia. However, his return was not without challenges. The Boyars, many of whom had survived Vlad's previous purges, were wary of his return and concerned about his methods. Vlad knew that to maintain his power, he would need to balance his iron-fisted approach with a degree of political acumen, ensuring that the nobility remained at least outwardly loyal. Conflict with the Ottoman Empire, 1468-1470 With his position in Wallachia secured, Vlad turned his attention once again to the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans, under Sultan Mem II, continued to pose a significant threat to Wallachia and the broader Christian territories of Eastern Europe. Vlad, emboldened by his return to power, was determined to resist Ottoman influence and maintain Wallachia's independence. In 1468 and 1469, Vlad conducted a series of raids into Ottoman territory, mirroring his earlier campaigns. These raids were characterized by their ferocity and the use of scorched earth tactics. Vlad's forces devastated Ottoman-held towns and villages, burning crops, destroying infrastructure, and impaling prisoners. These actions were intended not just to inflict military losses on the Ottomans, but also to undermine their morale and demonstrate Vlad's resolve. The Ottomans, in response, launched their own campaigns against Wallachia. However, Vlad's intimate knowledge of the terrain and his use of guerrilla tactics allowed him to evade large-scale confrontations while continuing to harass Ottoman forces. This period of conflict was one of attrition, with neither side able to secure a decisive victory. Vlad's ability to resist the Ottomans during these years further solidified his reputation as a formidable military leader and a defender of Christendom. 
Despite these successes, the ongoing conflict took a heavy toll on Wallachia. The constant warfare strained the region's resources, and the civilian population suffered from the devastation of the land. Vlad's harsh rule, combined with the pressures of war, led to growing discontent among the people and the nobility. This unrest would become a significant challenge for Vlad as he sought to maintain control over his domain. Internal struggles and challenges, 1470 to 1471. By 1470, Vlad's position in Wallachia had become increasingly precarious. While he had managed to fend off Ottoman incursions and maintain his rule, the internal divisions within Wallachia had deepened. The boyars, many of whom had initially supported Vlad's return, grew increasingly disillusioned with his methods. Vlad's brutal tactics and his uncompromising approach to governance alienated many of the noble families who feared that they could be the next targets of his wrath. In addition to the boyar opposition, Vlad faced challenges from within his own family. His younger brother, Radu the Handsome, who had been raised in the Ottoman court and was favored by Sultan Mem II, remained a persistent rival. Radu, who had previously ruled Wallachia as an Ottoman puppet, continued to seek support from both the Ottomans and disaffected Wallachian nobles to reclaim the throne. The rivalry between the brothers added a personal dimension to the broader political conflict, further destabilizing the region. The situation in Wallachia became increasingly untenable as Vlad struggled to balance the demands of war with the need to maintain internal order. His reliance on fear and brutality, while effective in the short term, eroded the trust and loyalty of his subjects. Vlad's rule was marked by constant vigilance as he sought to suppress dissent and prevent potential uprisings. Despite his best efforts, the seeds of rebellion had been sown, and Vlad knew that his hold on power was becoming increasingly fragile. The final campaigns, 1471 to 1472. In 1471, Vlad faced one of his most significant challenges as voivode of Wallachia. The Ottomans, determined to bring Wallachia back under their control, launched a major offensive against Vlad's forces. Sultan Mem II, who had been focused on other campaigns, now directed his attention towards Wallachia, viewing Vlad as a persistent and dangerous adversary. The Ottoman offensive was met with fierce resistance from Vlad and his forces. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, Vlad employed his trademark tactics of surprise attacks, night raids, and the use of the rugged Carpathian terrain to his advantage. However, the sheer size and resources of the Ottoman army made it increasingly difficult for Vlad to hold his ground. The ongoing conflict further devastated Wallachia, with towns and villages caught in the crossfire between the two forces. As the situation grew more desperate, Vlad sought to rally support from Hungary and other Christian powers. He argued that Wallachia was a crucial buffer state and that its fall to the Ottomans would open the door for further Ottoman incursions into Europe. However, by this time, Vlad's relationship with Matthias Corvinus had become strained. The Hungarian king, who had once been Vlad's ally, was now more focused on consolidating his own power in Hungary and dealing with internal challenges. Although Vlad received some support, it was not enough to turn the tide of the conflict. In 1472, Vlad launched one of his final campaigns against the Ottomans. This campaign, like his earlier ones, was marked by brutal tactics and a determination to resist Ottoman domination. However, it was clear that Vlad's position was becoming increasingly untenable. The constant warfare had depleted Wallachia's resources, and the support he received from Hungary and other allies was insufficient to sustain a prolonged conflict. As the campaign dragged on, 
Vlad's forces suffered significant losses and his ability to maintain control over Wallachia weakened. The Ottomans, sensing that Vlad was vulnerable, intensified their efforts to bring him down. By the end of 1472, Vlad's situation had become dire, with his hold on power slipping and the threat of Ottoman conquest looming ever larger. The beginning of the end, 1472. By the end of 1472, Vlad III's reign was nearing its conclusion. The constant warfare, both external and internal, had taken a heavy toll on his principality and his ability to rule effectively. His reputation as a fearsome and ruthless leader, while still formidable, was no longer enough to maintain the loyalty of his subjects or to deter his enemies. Vlad's final years were marked by a sense of impending doom. The Ottomans, having secured significant victories against his forces, were closing in on Wallachia, determined to install a ruler more amenable to their interests. Within Wallachia, the boyars and other nobles, exhausted by years of conflict and increasingly resentful of Vlad's harsh rule, began to turn against him. The very methods that had secured Vlad's power in the past, fear, brutality, and unwavering authority, had now alienated the people he needed most. As 1472 came to a close, Vlad III faced the most serious threat of his life. The Ottomans were preparing for a final push into Wallachia, and Vlad knew that his options were limited. The alliances he had relied on in the past had weakened, and his ability to resist a full-scale invasion was in doubt. The next chapter of Vlad's life would be one of survival, as he faced the ultimate test of his leadership and his legacy as the Voivode of Wallachia. As 1472 drew to a close, Vlad III's situation in Wallachia had become increasingly dire. The Ottomans were closing in, and the internal divisions within Wallachia were deepening. The boyars, who had long been wary of Vlad's brutal methods, were now openly hostile, and many sought to align themselves with other factions, including Vlad's younger brother Radu, who remained a favorite of the Ottoman court. Vlad's attempts to rally support from Hungary and other Christian powers met with limited success. Matthias Corvinus, who had once been a strong ally, was preoccupied with his own concerns in Hungary and was reluctant to commit significant resources to aid Vlad. The support Vlad did receive was insufficient to counter the growing Ottoman threat, and it became clear that he could no longer rely on external allies to secure his position. During this time, Vlad continued to resist the Ottomans, launching raids and employing guerrilla tactics in a last-ditch effort to stave off their advance. However, these efforts were increasingly desperate, and the resources available to Vlad were dwindling. The constant warfare had left Wallachia devastated, with its economy in ruins and its people exhausted by years of conflict. Internally, Vlad's rule was further undermined by a resurgence of boyar opposition. The boyars, many of whom had lost family members to Vlad's purges, saw an opportunity to rid themselves of a ruler they had long feared and resented. This internal dissent, combined with the external pressure from the Ottomans, made Vlad's position increasingly untenable. The Fall of Wallachia 1474 to 1475. By 1474, the Ottomans had launched a full-scale invasion of Wallachia. Sultan Mem II, determined to bring the rebellious principality back under Ottoman control, deployed a large and well-equipped army to crush Vlad's resistance once and for all. The Ottomans, having learned from their previous encounters with Vlad, employed overwhelming force and strategic coordination in their campaign. Despite his best efforts, Vlad was unable to repel the Ottoman advance. The sheer size and power of the Ottoman army, 
combined with the internal divisions within Wallachia, made it impossible for Vlad to mount an effective defense. Towns and fortresses fell to the Ottomans one by one, and Vlad was forced to retreat, taking refuge in the Carpathian Mountains, where he continued to resist through guerrilla tactics. During this period, Vlad's supporters dwindled as more and more boyars and nobles defected to the Ottoman side or sought to align themselves with Radu, who was now actively supported by the Ottomans as a potential ruler of Wallachia. Vlad's ability to maintain control over his forces diminished, and his once loyal commanders began to question his leadership as the situation grew increasingly desperate. In 1475, Vlad made a final attempt to regain control of Wallachia, launching a counteroffensive against the Ottoman forces. This campaign, while initially successful in reclaiming some territory, ultimately failed to turn the tide of the war. The Ottomans, with their superior numbers and resources, quickly regrouped and pushed Vlad's forces back, forcing him to retreat once again into the mountains. Final Attempts and Betrayal, 1475 to 1476. As 1475 gave way to 1476, Vlad III's situation had become increasingly hopeless. The Ottomans were firmly in control of most of Wallachia, and Vlad's ability to resist had been reduced to a series of small, isolated engagements. His attempts to rally additional support from Hungary and other Christian powers continued to meet with limited success, as his reputation as a ruthless and unpredictable leader made him a difficult ally to fully support. In late 1475 or early 1476, Vlad made a final, desperate plea for assistance to Matthias Corvinus, who had by this time recognized the strategic importance of Wallachia as a buffer against the Ottomans. Corvinus, although reluctant, provided Vlad with a small force of Hungarian soldiers and mercenaries, hoping to use him as a tool to destabilize the Ottoman hold on Wallachia. However, this support came too late to make a significant difference. In 1476, Vlad launched his final campaign to reclaim Wallachia, leading his forces in a last-ditch effort to oust the ottoman back ruler, who by this time was either Radu or another Ottoman puppet. Vlad's campaign was characterized by fierce battles and his trademark brutal tactics, but the odds were heavily stacked against him. It was during this final campaign that Vlad's fate was sealed. As he advanced through Wallachia, he was betrayed by a faction of his own men, likely boyars who had long resented his rule or who saw an opportunity to gain favor with the Ottomans. The details of Vlad's final moments are shrouded in mystery, but it is believed that he was ambushed and killed in battle sometime in late 1476 or early 1477. Vlad's body was reportedly decapitated, and his head was sent to Sultan Mem II as a trophy, a symbol of the Ottoman victory over one of their most formidable and feared adversaries. His body was allegedly buried at the monastery of Snagov, though the exact location of his grave remains a matter of speculation and legend. Vlad III's Importance in World History Vlad III, also known as Vlad the Impaler in Dracula, holds a significant place in world history, primarily due to his role in the defense of Eastern Europe against the Ottoman Empire during the 15th century. His life and actions had far-reaching consequences, both in the context of the political dynamics of his time and in shaping the historical narrative of resistance against Ottoman expansion. 1. Defender of Christendom Vlad III is often remembered as a staunch defender of Christendom against the encroaching forces of the Ottoman Empire. During the 15th century, the Ottoman Empire was rapidly expanding into Europe, threatening the stability of Christian kingdoms in the region. Wallachia, situated between Christian Europe and the Ottoman-controlled Balkans, was a crucial buffer state. 
Vlad's leadership in resisting Ottoman incursions was seen as part of the broader struggle to prevent the spread of Islam into Europe. Vlad's military campaigns against the Ottomans, particularly his raids across the Danube and the infamous night attack at Targovist, showcased his strategic acumen and his ability to inflict significant damage on a much larger and more powerful enemy. These actions, while brutal, were seen by many in Europe as a necessary defense against a formidable adversary. Vlad's resistance, though ultimately unsuccessful in the long term, played a crucial role in slowing the Ottoman advance and provided a rallying point for Christian forces. 2. A symbol of nationalism and resistance, in the centuries following his death, Vlad III became a symbol of national pride and resistance in Romania, particularly in Wallachia, where he ruled. His efforts to maintain Wallachian independence in the face of external pressures resonated with later generations, especially during periods when Romania was under foreign domination or influence. Vlad's legacy as a national hero is celebrated in Romanian folklore and history, where he is often depicted as a just and strong leader who protected his people from invaders. The complex nature of his rule, characterized by both his defense of the realm and his ruthless methods, reflects the harsh realities of leadership in a time of constant warfare and political instability. Vlad's actions are often interpreted within the context of the extreme measures needed to survive and maintain sovereignty in a volatile region. 3. Influence on Medieval Warfare and Governance Vlad III's methods of warfare and governance left a lasting impact on the strategies employed in Medieval Eastern Europe. His use of guerrilla tactics, scorched earth policies, and psychological warfare such as the mass impalements, were tactics that not only served to deter enemies, but also to consolidate his power at home. These methods were brutal, but they were effective in the short term, allowing Vlad to maintain control over a fractious and divided territory. Vlad's approach to governance, which combined fear and strict discipline, also influenced the way rulers in the region approached their own leadership challenges. His reign highlighted the importance of strong, centralized authority in maintaining order in a land frequently torn by internal conflicts and external threats. While his reign was marked by extreme violence, it also demonstrated the lengths to which a ruler might go to protect their sovereignty and maintain control. Vlad III in Popular Culture Vlad III's transformation from a historical figure into a cultural icon is a fascinating journey that spans centuries. His legacy has been shaped not only by historical accounts but also by literature, film, and other forms of media, making him one of the most recognizable figures in popular culture. 1. Bram Stoker's Dracula the most significant factor in Vlad III's entry into popular culture was his association with Bram Stoker's 1897 novel Dracula. Stoker, an Irish author, drew inspiration from the legends surrounding Vlad the Impaler when creating the character of Count Dracula, though he took considerable artistic license in crafting the story. In Stoker's novel, Count Dracula is a centuries-old vampire who resides in a decaying castle in Transylvania and preys on the blood of the living. While Stoker's Dracula is a fictional character, the connection to Vlad III, who is known for his brutal methods of punishment, including impalement, helped to cement the association between the historical figure and the vampire legend. Stoker's novel was a huge success and has since become one of the most famous works of Gothic literature. The character of Dracula, with his blend of aristocratic charm, terrifying power, and dark mystique, became a cultural archetype, influencing countless adaptations and reinterpretations in literature, film, and other media. 2. Film and Television The figure of Dracula as inspired by Vlad III, 
has been adapted into numerous films and television shows, further embedding Vlad's legacy in popular culture. The 1931 film Dracula, starring Bela Lugosi, is one of the most iconic representations of the character and set the standard for many subsequent portrayals. Lugosi's performance, with his distinct accent and menacing presence, became the quintessential image of Dracula in the minds of many viewers. Over the decades, Dracula has been portrayed in various ways, ranging from the horrifying to the sympathetic, but always retaining elements of the original inspiration. Films like Dracula, 1958, with Christopher Lee, Bram Stoker's Dracula, 1992, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, and Dracula Untold, 2014, have continued to explore the character's roots in history, often linking the fictional vampire to the real-life Vlad III. These adaptations have contributed to the enduring popularity of Dracula as a character, making him a symbol of the supernatural, the mysterious, and the macabre. Through these portrayals, Vlad III's historical identity has been intertwined with the vampire mythos, creating a hybrid figure that exists both as a terrifying warlord and an immortal vampire. 3. Literature and Comics Beyond Stoker's novel, Vlad III and Dracula have appeared in a wide range of literary works and comic books. Writers have explored the character in historical fiction, often blurring the lines between fact and fantasy. Vlad's life has been the subject of numerous novels that reimagine his story, sometimes portraying him as a tragic hero, sometimes as a villain. In the world of comics, Dracula has been a recurring character, particularly in horror and supernatural genres. Marvel Comics, for instance, introduced Dracula as a major antagonist in its Tomb of Dracula series, where he interacts with superheroes and other supernatural beings. This portrayal of Dracula as both a fearsome vampire lord and a complex character with a tragic backstory draws on the historical Vlad III while expanding his influence into modern pop culture. 4. Tourism and Cultural Impact the association between Vlad III and Dracula has had a significant impact on tourism in Romania, particularly in Transylvania and Wallachia. Sites associated with Vlad, such as Bran Castle, often incorrectly referred to as Dracula's Castle, Poenary Castle, and the town of Sigasora, have become popular tourist destinations, attracting visitors interested in both the historical figure and the vampire legend. This tourism has had a cultural impact, shaping the way Vlad III is remembered and celebrated in his homeland. While some Romanians view the Dracula Association as a distortion of their national hero's true legacy, others embrace the global interest in Vlad as a means of promoting Romanian history and culture. Festivals, museums, and tours dedicated to Vlad and Dracula continue to draw visitors from around the world, ensuring that his story remains in the public consciousness. 5. Symbolism and Legacy in popular culture, Vlad III's legacy has taken on symbolic meanings that go beyond his historical actions. He represents the archetype of the ruthless ruler, the defender of the homeland, and the embodiment of the fearsome and the unknown. The character of Dracula, as derived from Vlad, has come to symbolize the darker aspects of human nature, power, immortality, and the capacity for violence. This symbolism has been explored in various artistic and philosophical contexts, where Dracula is seen as a metaphor for the exploitation of power, the fear of death, and the struggle between good and evil. The character's enduring appeal lies in his ability to embody multiple layers of meaning, making him a versatile figure in storytelling across different cultures and eras. Vlad III's significance in world history and popular culture is vast and multifaceted. 
As a historical figure, he played a crucial role in the defense of Eastern Europe against the Ottoman Empire, leaving a legacy of resistance and national pride in Romania. His brutal methods of rule and military tactics have been both condemned and admired, depending on the perspective of those assessing his impact. In popular culture, Vlad's transformation into Dracula has made him one of the most iconic figures in literature and film. The character of Dracula, inspired by Vlad's fearsome reputation, has become a global symbol of the supernatural, the mysterious, and the dark side of human nature. Through countless adaptations and reinterpretations, Vlad III's legacy continues to evolve, ensuring that his story remains a potent and enduring part of both history and the collective imagination. Thank you for joining me on this journey through the life and legacy of Vlad III, the historical figure who inspired the legendary character of Dracula. From his fierce resistance against the Ottoman Empire to his lasting impact on popular culture, Vlad's story is a fascinating blend of history and myth. His legacy continues to captivate and intrigue people around the world, reminding us of the complex and often dark nature of power and leadership. If you enjoyed this deep dive into history, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more captivating stories. Your support helps us bring these tales to life, and I'm excited to share even more incredible histories with you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.